All right. Welcome to Brentwood Lighthouse Baptist Church. Great to be here with you today. And I was just thinking, uh, just uh, speaking of the condition of this world and uh, how great it is to be able to come together and fellowship and revere God together. It's becoming more and more special to be with the people of God and uh, really a blessing. So thank you for joining us here today. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, and we do praise you, God. You are great. You are awesome. You are beautiful and wonderful. You are worthy and worthy to be praised. Lord Jesus, we honor you. We bring you glory. We give you all the glory, all the honor, all the power, and all the praise here today, God. We gather to do that for you. You are mighty and awesome, Lord. You have saved us. You have adopted us, God. You have chosen us, placed us in your family, in your kingdom. We offer our thanks and our praise, our highest honor, Lord, to you today in this place. And we thank you for the opportunity to gather together here in your house, Lord, and to tell you how thankful we are and how great you are. And we love you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, we're starting a new uh, series today. It's called, Who's Your Father? We're going to be in Galatians chapter 4, verse 1 through 7, here in a little bit when we get to the Bible reading. Um, I've been thinking a lot about this, and it will contrast with the world today. Things the Bible says and what the Bible tells us, what God tells us about his fatherhood over us, how we became children, the biblical doctrines, the truth of God's word exposed. I pray that uh, as we experience this series that you will understand not only that your life is completely changed, the testimonies we hear today And as Yuki's song said, the the convincing of sin is is absolute in the Christian life. Our Father has adopted us and convinced us of sin, and our lives are changed and made new and right. And that is a blessing of God. Whoever our Father is, and I'm going to be contrasting this series often with the world, according to what the Bible says, whoever he is, that's who you're going to spend eternity with. Whoever your father is, spiritually, is where your spirit and your soul are going to spend eternity with your father. Who is your father? Amen. Come on, come on. I'm going to start with a reading uh, from John. It's a, it's a review of a, of a past um, study verse we read. And I'm going to set the table with this reading. It's going to be from uh, 1 John 3, uh, 7 through 10. I'm just going to read this and then we'll set the table. 1 John 3, 7 through 10. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin, because his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. Amen? Amen. 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 We're going to get into this. And the convincing of sin was key. As Yuki Song exposed, the Holy Spirit convincing us of sin, not continuing in sin... I'll just elaborate a little, is when you're convinced of sin. When you can stand here or there or even up here on the pulpit and say, I came to the conclusion that everything in my life was so sinful. 
It doesn't mean that I don't ever sin. It means that I cannot continue sinning. I've come to the conclusion, you have come to the conclusion that your previous life was completely filled with sin. And you cannot go on that way. And you can stand and proclaim and testify. As Doug said this morning, your testimony is, I have sinned. And I am convinced of it. And I cannot go on that way. Amen? Amen. Amen. Um, a little note, verse 4, 1 through 7, as we dig into the word. Um, it was titled, The Sonship of Believers. Who is our Father? The Sonship of Believers. Uh, in verse 4, uh, in chapter 4, verse 1 through 7, Paul expands on the analogy of a child's coming of age, brought forth in chapter 3, 24, and 26, contrasting believers' lives before salvation as children and servants with their lives after salvation as adults and sons. Both Jews and Gentiles really understood this imagery, since Jews, Greeks, and Romans all had ceremonies to mark a son's coming of age. Paul contrasts your birth into the kingdom of God when God became your father with a child before he was to come of age. And they all had ceremonies and they understood this principle. You all know they have the bar mitzvah, they have the coming of aid, the quinceanera, even today in our cultures, right? Everybody has a period when they come of age. And God is contrasting you before you were a believer. And you know who kept you then. Who kept you in bondage before you came of age? What kept you in bondage? Sin and the, the devil and the law. Sin and the devil and the law kept you in bondage before you came of age. And you became a believer. Galatians chapter 4, 1 through 7. We're going to read together. Galatians 4, 1 through 7. Sonship in Christ. Now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the Father. So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, let's break it down. These are the doctrines of sonship of the believers. Verse 1 through 7. Let's take a look and break it down a little. In verse 1, let's read verse 1. Now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ from a slave, although he is owner of everything. So you were chosen by God, you were a child, and Paul contrasts the child before your coming of age. He's contrasting before salvation and after salvation. Paul's metaphorically contrasting this, and he says, as you were a child, does not differ from a slave, and we'll get into the meaning of that, but you are owner of everything. You were still predestined, even though you were kept in bondage, bondage under the law. Amen? And God has always known you and how much He loves you and how much He cares for you and how much you are the apple of His eye. And you have always been owner of everything. But He kept you in that place as a child. Amen? Child. The Greek word refers to a child too young to talk 
a minor, spiritually and intellectually immature, and not ready for privileges and responsibilities of adulthood. That is the original meaning of the Greek word of the word child used in the Bible. Let's read verse 2. Chapter 4, verse 2 says, But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the Father. Guardians and managers. Guardians were slaves entrusted with care of underage boys. Managers, while managers manage their property until they came of age, along with the tutor, found in verse three, chapter 3, verse 24. The tutor was the law, remember? The law was the tutor. They, 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 the managers and guardians, had nearly complete control of the child, so that for all practical purposes, a child under their care did not differ from a slave. Which is simply why the Bible says we are slaves to sin. Slaves to sin. Under bondage to the law before salvation. These are even God's chosen children. You were kept in bondage. You were kept as a child under the elemental things of the world. Praise God. Verse 3. Chapter 4, verse 3 reads, So also, while we were, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. The, verse, the term, while we were children in bondage, before our coming of age, now understand, before you came to Christ, we had a beautiful testimony from this gentleman today about the, 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 purpose, the purposeful change in his life before he came of age. He described perfectly how he was kept in bondage under the law, under sin, and he testifies now that he was prayed for, he received Christ, he understood, his eyes were open, and he came of age. He was transformed in Jesus Christ. Amen? The beautiful. Before our coming of age, when we, when we came to saving faith in Jesus Christ, very simple, coming of age, coming to saving faith in Jesus Christ. We see the term kept under the elemental things of the world in 4.3. Kept under the elemental things of the world. Elemental things of the world. Elemental is a form of a Greek word meaning row or rank. And used to speak of basic foundational things like letters in the alphabet. In light of its use in verse 9, it is better seen here, and we'll look at verse 9 later on, it is better seen here as basic elements of human religion. So the term elemental things of the world is being better referred to here as the elemental things of basic world religion. Paul describes both Jewish and Gentile religions and rituals as elemental. This gets good. Because they are merely human, never rising to the level of divine. Both centered on man-made systems of works filled with laws, rituals, and ceremonies to be performed as to achieve divine acceptance. All such rudimentary elements are immature, like behaviors of children under bondage to a guardian. God is relating the behaviors of the rudimentary churches, religions, that don't follow Jesus Christ as immature behaviors, set up with rituals, laws, and works as to achieve some form of of divine enlightenment, empowerment, or dare we say, their own man-made salvation. Without Jesus Christ, you know that that is impossible. It's impossible. God says the works of children kept under bondage, under managers and guardians, playing their games, if you will, right? Achieving God's status through rudimentary childlike behaviors. 
Verse 4. Verse 4 says, But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. So God essentially is watching the whole world perform in its rudimentary values under managers and guardians, which are children kept before they come of age. The fullness of time found in verse 4. But when the fullness of time came, in God's timetable, this is when the exact religious, cultural, and political conditions demanded by his perfect plan were all in place. Jesus Christ came into the world at that time. Amen? Amen. God sent forth his son in verse 4. When, when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son. So when the exact position of the world with their religions, their rudimentary behaviors, their struggles, their strife, their inability to ever save themselves, when that time was perfectly set, God sent forth his son. As a father set the time for the ceremony of his son becoming of age and being released from the guardians, managers, and tutors, so God set his son at the precise moment to bring all who believe out from under bondage to the law. A truth that Jesus repeatedly affirmed that the father sent Jesus into the world. The meaning of the, ver of the, meaning of the speech the Father sent His Son into the world. This teaches His pre-existence as the eternal second member of the Trinity. So here we find the Father sending His Son. The Bible is telling us that it's acknowledging that the eternal existence of Jesus Christ with the Father, the second member of the Trinity, is affirmed. We're going to look at some verses here. Okay? Uh, we're going to look at uh, John 5.30 first. John 5.30 says, I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. Amen? We're going to look at John 5.36. But the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John. For the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do testify about me that the Father has sent me. Amen? Amen. We're going to look at John 12, 49. Where I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. Amen? So what are we gleaning here? Jesus was sent by the Father. And the Father has told Jesus every word and what Jesus says is true. And he is affirming in the doctrinal purposes of this Bible that the word is true, that he was sent by God, and that God gave him a commandment. We're going to look at John 20, 19, and 22 through 22. John 20, 19 through 22 says... So when it was evening, on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today God breathes on us. He tells you, your Father tells you, Receive my Spirit. Open your heart. 
I pray that today Jesus will breathe on us right here in Brentwood Lighthouse Baptist Church. We need his spirit more than anything. And we thank you and we praise you, God. You are awesome and you are mighty. Thank you, Lord. In verse 4, you see the phrase, born of a woman. Galatians 4, 4. Sent forth, born of a woman. We're going to break this down a little more. This emphasizes Jesus' full humanity. Not merely his virgin birth. Jesus had to be fully God for his sacrifice to be of the infinite worth needed to atone for sin. But he also had to be fully man so he could take upon himself the penalty of sin as the substitute for man. Jesus took your place. Well, that's something we're going to remember today. Jesus took your place because we deserved what? Death. And Jesus took our place. Something very pointed here. Let's take a look at Luke 1, 32 through 35. Luke 1, 32 through 35 says, He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will be, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom will have no end. Come on. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you, Father. Thank you, God. We see the term again in verse 4. Born of a woman, God sent forth his son. Verse 4, born of a woman, born under the law. Very particular points made here in these verses. Under the law, like all men, he's 100% man and he's 100% God. Able to take your place for sin and able to know your every pain and your every hurt and your every desire and your every need fully like a man. The depths of your heart, he knows. Like all men, Jesus was obligated to obey God's law. But unlike any man, however, Jesus obeyed the law perfectly. His perfect sinlessness made him the unblemished sacrifice for all sin who perfectly obeyed God in everything. That perfect righteousness... That perfect righteousness that Jesus obtained is what is imputed to those who believe in Him. Amen. Who is your Father? Who is your Father? Who imputed the perfect righteousness of His Son who took your place on the cross and died for you. And His perfect behavior before God, something we cannot achieve is imputed to you. Amen? Let's take a look at 2 Corinthians 5.21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Amen? Beautiful. Verse 5. Verse 5 reads... Galatians 4, chapter 4, verse 5. So that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Here we go. Who's your father? Redeem those under the law. Verse 5. Guilty sinners condemned under law's demands and its curse. What was the curse? The curse of the law was anyone who sins under the law deserves a death. Who pronounced that curse? God did. God the Father pronounced that curse. Anyone who sins dies. But you're out not you're not under it anymore. You're out from under that. You are out from under that. God is not a man that he should lie, or the Son of Man that he should repent. Remember, God cursed 
God put the curse on the law. All who sin and break the law shall die. Spoken by God. But it says now that the guilty sinners whose only hope is a Savior, that you will be redeemed from under the law. The Bible says that you are ad the adoption as sons. Those under the law, their only hope is a Savior. All those kept under the law, that entails the whole world, whose only hope is a Savior. May they please understand the need for the Savior. We see the phrase adoption as sons. Redeem those under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. This is how we become children of God. Adoption is the act of bringing someone who is the offspring of another into one's own family. Since unregenerate people, unbelievers, are by nature children of the devil, the only way they can become God's children is by spiritual adoption. Let's take a look at Ephesians 1.5. Ephesians 1.5 says, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. This is the Bible exposing God's plan how you became a son and daughter of God, how God became your father. He predestined it to happen through adoption, taking you from one family. Now who was your father in the previous family? The devil. The Bible says that unregenerate unbelievers, their father is the devil. It's something that I want you to take away into the world and help you understand why we pity them, although we despise the activities of the devil and our Jesus came to destroy his works, we pity them because they're under the authority of their father, the devil. The Bible says it's an understanding that we have to take away. Who is your father? And the Bible says that every person out there that is unregenerate in unbelief, their father is the devil. And you have to take that away in your understanding. And you have to understand about adoption. God removing you from one family and placing you in another family. Many of you know some of the stories of adoption, how adoption under law, under a judge in those days was ironclad. It, a, a child of a mother or a father could be removed easily in those days. Like you put them up for adoption. That happened all the time. But do you know that when you adopted someone in the court of the ancient days, that when the judge sat there, that you swore an oath with witnesses and believers and fellow family members, that when you adopted that child, that that adoption could never be broken. Amen? And that is what God has done for you. And that is why when we get adopted, when we say we're adopted, we know that it is forever. We know that God doesn't leave or break his adoptive principles. You are adopted. Verse 6, winding down. Verse 6 says, Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Praise God. Now, this gets really good. Spirit of His Son. It is the Holy Spirit who works to confirm to believers their adoption as children of God. Through your testimonies, through your previous life, through what happened to you, the Holy Spirit works in you to confirm that you are adopted into His family. It's the Holy Spirit's job to do that. And you stand up and you testify, my life changed. I am different. I know that I sinned. I don't go on sinning. I confess my sin. It doesn't mean that I don't ever do something wrong. It means that I stand before you and confess that my life was filled with sin and I was guilty of it. And I will not go on that way. I stand guilty before God. 
affirmed by Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Who brings me that peace. That I can forever be blessed in my affirmation of maintaining my peace that God has adopted me. And can an adoption be broken? No. Even by the ancient human courts, the adoption cannot be broken. Keep your peace. Master your peace. Chosen and adopted by God. Spirit of His Son. Assurance of salvation is a gracious work of the Holy Spirit and does not come from any human source. It comes from this Word. That's why we read the Bible in depth, in detail. That's why we're here together to fellowship and read the Word. Because this assurance that you've been adopted by God it doesn't come from any human source. It only comes from the written Word of God. God is telling you today in His Word, adoption. He tells you in his word today, he wrote this letter to us, a love letter saying, I have adopted you from one family to another. And this is where your assurance comes from, from the holy word of God. Amen? We see the term Abba, Abba Father. In the scripture we see, you are sons of God sent forth. The spirit of his son is, not only is he in our hearts, he causes us to cry, Abba Father. This is an Aram term of endearment used by young children and many of you know to speak to their fathers it is the equivalent of the word daddy who's your father who's your daddy the scripture says that your daddy is God that you've been adopted and you can now call him daddy your daddy your father is no longer the enemy you've been adopted and he is now your father who's your father and I want you to remember that and how blessed you are to call him Father and how terribly stricken the world is to not know him. And the biblical doctrine says, it tells you, you don't tell them who their father is. God tells us who their father is. Amen? And we pity them. And we say, but by the grace of God, there goes us. It gives us a deeper understanding to help you cope with the world. It's helping you cope with people that literally seem maddening. They're getting their direction and their hope from man-made sources, and it is nothing but destructive. But you have to leave here today with a better understanding of who your father is. Amen? Verse 7, lastly. Verse 7 reads, Galatians chapter 4, verse 7. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Amen. If a son, then an heir through God. God is your father, and you inherit his blessing, which is eternal life in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Today, I pray that you'll have a deeper understanding of the doctrinal principles of how God has adopted you and chosen you and why the scriptures say that he is your father. I don't know if you're out there. I don't know if you're here today, out there virtually, watching online today, a week from now, a month from now, or a year from now. Who could know? your father except for God himself I don't know if you've made that choice the scripture says until you choose Christ that you are kept under the elemental things and your father is the devil you can make that choice you can be adopted by God you can acknowledge your sin repent of your sin today and God's not mad and God loves us. If you're out there, if you want to be adopted into God's family and removed from the family of hate and placed in the family of love, you can begin that today and I ask you to pray with me. I ask you to receive Christ right now in your heart. Pray with me. Dear God, I know that I am a sinner. I want to turn from my sins 
and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe that Jesus Christ is your son. I believe he died for my sins and that you raised him to life. I want to receive him into my heart and to allow him to take control of my life. I want to trust Jesus as my savior and follow him as my Lord from this day forward. Please, God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let that be your beginning. Let that be your beginning of your adoption to the family of God. We're going to have a couple of minutes of meditation. And then Doug will come up for our closing. We'll have a little song and a blessing. I ask you to leave here today refreshed. Thank God for the blessing of his word. Medi just meditate. Clear your heart. Thank him. Speak to him. Pray to him. Tell him you love him. Give him anything that's on your heart that you don't want anymore. We'll take a couple of minutes and then Doug will close us out. Thank you.